inspiring stories. Women, young girls at that time, we're not supposed to be out there playing. They wanted us in the kitchen. Of empowered women. We've been doing it on every front and in heels. Well, that's the matter is a lot different here. Empowering different other women. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to stand up. Would the crowd. women please stand? Let's give them another round of applause. To keep breaking barriers. To be here as part of the first female majority legislature in the country. Tonight, we're celebrating women. Welcome to Celebrating Women, an 8 News Now special for Women's History Month. I'm Christiane Klein. And I'm Denise Valdez. Tonight, we are going to be sharing some incredible stories of inspiring women who have helped shape our city into what it is today. We're here at the Neon Museum in downtown Las Vegas, a place dedicated to collecting, preserving, and displaying iconic signs that have played a role in adding to our city's culture. It's a place that might not exist were it not for the first woman we'll be highlighting tonight, Jan Jones Blackhurst. A true Nevada trailblazer, Jones Blackhurst made history when she catapulted from the private to the public sector, becoming the first ever female mayor of Las Vegas. She served from 1991 to 1999, but continues to pave the way for women two decades later. Jan Jones Blackhurst looks back on that time as a high point in a high profile career. This is one mayor will never get amnesia because we're all in this together. And what when I was elected mayor, um, which I ran on dare because they said a woman couldn't win. I think it was all of the unseen women voices that won that race when everybody said it couldn't be done. It hadn't been done. Jones was the first woman to lead Las Vegas and do so during a time of explosive growth. At, at that moment in time, remember, the city of Las Vegas was 250,000 people. We didn't even have a bus system. She started from the ground up crafting the city's master plan, which included anchoring Clark County's government center in the heart of the city. The county was getting ready to move to Summerlin, so I held a press conference and offered them the land for a dollar. They couldn't say no. In the mid-90s, the Strip was booming, but downtown was dying. One of her most controversial legacies was creating the Fremont Street Experience. Years later, the Neon Museum attractions that are now a part of the fabric of Las Vegas. I think today I'd be a much better politician. I understand that there are rules in a game just like there are rules in business, there are rules in politics. And understanding those rules make you more impactful and effective as a leader. Now as a leading executive for Caesars Entertainment, she's on the front lines of a familiar fight, gender equity pay. I say that I've been giving the same speech for 25 years, that white women earn 78 cents to the dollar as their male, white male counterparts. That's why she strongly believes in building girls up at a young age. If you, if you get their interest early, they're learning the math skills, the engineering skills. You bring women who are in those kinds of jobs, and now they have role models. So what advice would she give women in the workforce? Use your voice so people know who you are. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to stand up in a crowd. Then never have any doubts of your ability to be that person at the top. Decades after her time as mayor, Jan Jones Blackhurst is still at the top of her game. Among the hundreds of high points and honors, Jones Blackhurst admits that having a school named after her was really the most humbling. From the first sign in the collection back in 1996, the Hacienda Horse and Rider, to the most recent sign in the collection, the Hard Rock Cafe sign that was erected earlier this month, none of it would have been possible without the support of Jan Jones Blackhurst. For more on her contributions, we're joined by Cynthia Barroso, Director of Curation and Education here at the Neon Museum. So Cynthia, how big of a role did Jones Black Blackhurst have in the beginning? Oh, a very big role. We are so grateful to Jan Jones Blackhurst for everything she's done for us. Uh, back when she was the mayor, back in the mid-90s, she pulled together um, a group and city, um, city officials to save the signs in Las Vegas and started to install them as public art along the boulevard. So that was the first um, beginnings of the Neon Museum. Then she worked with um, community groups and city officials to create a non profit organization, which was the foundation of our museum that you see here today. So we are very, very grateful for her, uh, her leadership and her vision. We couldn't have done it without her. And we'll give our viewers more peeks at this museum throughout this half hour special. 
All still to come on Celebrating Women, breaking barriers on the basketball court. Mark got drafted to go over to Europe, but when he found out that it was him, he told him, nah, you were drafting my sister. The extraordinary measures one athlete took at a time when basketball was just for the boys. Plus, the first state in the country with a female majority legislature. How Nevada is changing the face of politics when celebrating women continues. Celebrating Women. I'm Denise Valdez. And I'm Christiane Klein. Nearly 100 years after women won the right to vote, Americans elected the most women ever to both houses of Congress. 25 are serving in the U.S. Senate and 102 now in the House of Representatives. Among them is newly elected Senator Jackie Rosen, who defeated incumbent Dean Heller in the midterms last year. Serving alongside Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, the pair makes Nevada one of only six states with two female U.S. Senators. I think now, with this election, those girls in junior high and high school, they're going to look at the United States Congress and the Senate and say, there's a woman like me out there. I can do that. Many have called this the era of women in politics. And here in Nevada, our state legislature celebrated a milestone that's getting attention around the country. For the first time in history, women make up the majority of its members, making ours the first women majority state legislature in the country. I was very honored and humbled to be here, to be able to sit in that chamber. Um, it's awe-inspiring and almost surreal. Tonight we are joined by the newly elected and appointed women who took a leap this past year and together made history. Would the women please stand? Let's give them another round of applause. For the first time in U.S. history, women outnumber men in the Nevada State Legislature at just more than 50%. Assistant Majority Leader Danielle Monroe Moreno, the first African-American women to serve in an assembly leadership role, says each and every one of the 32 female legislators are blazing a trail. It's important to have us at the table because we bring a different dynamic to the conversation to move our state forward. There's, there's a cliche saying that when women do better, families do better. When families do better, our state does better. Democrats make up the majority party, but newly elected female lawmakers from both parties are are hoping to find common ground on issues like education. Education is the key to opening doors for opportunities for our kids, for their futures. And so I think that as women, we can provide good conversations and good um, experience um, in, that, in that area. These women are hoping their collective experiences will help them lead Nevada State Legislature forward in the coming months and create change for years to come. It meant a lot. Uh, all the women that had come before me and now being able to help the next generation that's coming up, it's, it, it's going to be a great adventure that we're going to have for the next four months. We're going to have diversity of thought. We're going to have diversity of opinions. We're going to have diversity of life experience. And so I think that's going to bring new ideas and, and a new way of uh, dealing with issues. And new issues will come up just because of that diversity. 
It's not just the state legislature. Nevada also has its first female majority Supreme Court. And the Clark County School Board of Trustees is not just majority female, it is entirely made up of women. More inspiring stories when celebrating women continues. Welcome back to Celebrating Women, an 8 News Now special for Women's History Month. I'm Christiane Klein. And I'm Denise Valdez. You know, it's not every day you get to meet someone who was the very first to do something, but our Kevin e. Martin got to do just that. Here she is with the story of a genuine pioneer in sports who just happens to live right here in Las Vegas. From the first time I picked up a basketball as an adolescent until now, a former Division I basketball player, I can't help but be grateful for the opportunities this sport has given me. And I know none of them would have been possible without the group of women that came before me. Didn't take no for an answer and became the pioneers on the hardwood. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to one of those women. Women, young girls at that time, we're not supposed to be out there playing. They wanted us in the kitchen. They wanted us playing with dolls. I got an army set for Christmas. Growing up in the 1960s, it was clear that Carte Hicks broke the mold. I mean, I was in elementary school playing sports, kicking the ball, hitting baseballs over the fence in the cafeterias. Whenever I wanted to do something with the girls, they all wouldn't, they didn't want me to play with them. They thought something was wrong with me. By the time Carte got to high school, there was absolutely no doubt this girl was born to ball and she wasn't going to let anything, even the fact that she was a girl, get in the way of her in the hardwood, even if it meant pretending to be her brother. They had taped me down, you know, my hair was always short, but and I can even talk like them a little bit, so the coach really didn't know that I was Cardi at the time. They would call me Marky. Mark got drafted to go over to Europe, but when he found out that it was him, he told him, nah, you were drafting my sister. In 1977, Carte became the first woman to be drafted and play on a men's professional team in Holland. A year later, she became the first woman to dunk in a pro game. One of the girls passed me the ball so high that I got up with two hands, slammed it, and hung on the rim, and it just, it was quiet. It was like, what just happened? In 1979, Carte returned home to play for the WBL, the first professional women's basketball league in the United States. She was a member of the San Francisco Pioneers before the league folded in 1981. Recently, I was with Carte for what she thought was an interview. What she didn't know was that we had also planned a reunion with one of her WBL teammates, Musette McKinney, AKA Moose, who she hadn't seen in 30 years. Oh my God, I don't believe you have that. Wait, wait a minute, how did you get this? I signed this for Moose. How'd she get Moose? Because she was just a was beast. Musette and ah, yeah, okay. she was a moose. I mean, she would just take down you and throw you down <laughs> and stuff. What's up, teammate? <laughs> this past June, Carte, Musette, and the rest of the WBL was inducted in the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame as Trailblazers of the Game. For Celebrating Women, I'm Kevin e. Martin. From a pioneer in sports to a pioneer in gaming, in 1950, Sarah Knight Preddy became the first and only woman of color to receive a gaming license in the state of Nevada. So we are here at the Jerry's Nugget sign with Cynthia Berwarso of the Neon Museum. And Cynthia, another pretty remarkable woman. Um, can you tell us more about Net Pretty and her connection to the sign behind us? Yes, I can. Uh, Saran worked at Jerry's Nugget for about seven years as well, and she was one of the very first black female casino dealers in Nevada. She sounds like another pioneer. So what did she do after that? After operating several uh, casinos, clubs, mm -hmm. and businesses in town, she eventually purchased the Moulin Rouge, which as you know is very important to the civil rights movement here in Las Vegas. She tried to bring it back to its former glory, and she worked very hard in the community over many years. She was quite a leader, and she eventually was instrumental in getting the 
Moulin Rouge designated to the National Register of Historic Places. Just from one landmark to the next. That's right. Yeah. All right, still ahead here on Celebrating Women. It was definitely a powerful moment for everyone. In a field dominated by men, it was six female crime scene analysts who responded after 1 October. We'll have more on their painstaking work from the field right after this. Welcome back to Celebrating Women in 8 News Now, special for Women's History Month. I'm Denise Valdez. And I'm Christiane Klein. It is no secret that law enforcement is a field dominated by men. But at Las Vegas Metro, more and more women are becoming crime scene analysts, or CSAs. In fact, it was six female CSAs who responded to Mandalay Bay and the Route 91 concert venue right after the 1 October shooting. Kristen Drummond has more on their story. A night unlike any other. It was definitely a powerful moment for everyone. Amy Nemsik sits at her desk and recalls one October. The crime scene analyst supervisor and her team responded to the South Las Vegas Strip after a gunman fired more than a thousand rounds of ammunition from his hotel room. Welcome back to Celebrating Women in 8 News Now, special for Women's History Month. I'm Denise Valdez. And I'm Christiane Klein. It is no secret that law enforcement is a field dominated by men. But at Las Vegas Metro, more and more women are becoming crime scene analysts, or CSAs. In fact, it was six female CSAs who responded to Mandalay Bay and the Route 91 concert venue right after the 1 October shooting. Kristen Drummond has more on their story. A night unlike any other. It was definitely a powerful moment for everyone. Amy Nemsik sits at her desk and recalls 1 October. The crime scene analyst supervisor and her team responded to the South Las Vegas Strip after a gunman fired more than a thousand rounds of ammunition from his hotel room on a crowd attending a country music festival. And you went up to the 32nd floor. Yes. What was it like that night walking in. I had a lot of very like surreal feelings getting there, but once I was there, it was business as usual. Definitely had some moments of, of very surreal, almost like euphoric, um, not in a good way in any way, shape or form, but just kind of almost like a little out of body moments, like, wow, this is, 
this is huge, but it was just get to work. CSAs look for clues to piece crimes together. We have a box cutter that's in there. Uh, right by the door. We spent a morning with CSA day shift supervisor Kristen Grammis to watch some of the team in action. We're going to go through the vehicle and see if there's any other evidence as to what happened. The CSAs here, all women, a noticeable difference from a decade ago. Over time, it has evolved to the point where we are primarily female. We have very few males. What do you think is attracting women to this profession? I don't know, it's a very detail-oriented position, and so I think that that's something that they love. A job not only requiring patients in the field. Kind of a slow process, we're not fast. But writing reports in the office. When I was working in the field, for about every hour you were out on a crime scene, you were spending at least an hour back here in the office. It's not interesting, so it wouldn't be highlighted in, in shows. Back at the car, the CSAs finish their work and make a determination. Is it safe to say this is a suicide? Yes. CSA see the worst, including the night of 1 October. Some, including NEMSEC, continue to process their emotions. They put it in a box. It's just in that box, and every once in a while I open the box a little bit and deal with, the, with some things, and then I just put it back in that box. Her team from that night split up, but NEMSEC knows they share an experience they can't forget. I definitely have a very unique bond with those five women that will last our entire career. We're celebrating women. I'm Kristen Drummond. Still to come, when she moved to Las Vegas 25 years ago, she was living off ramen and mac and cheese. Now she's an executive and a familiar face in our community. Punda Mathers shares her secret to success when celebrating women continues. Welcome back to Celebrating Women. We're sharing stories of women who helped shape Las Vegas from a place dedicated to preserving our city's culture. Las Vegas' most iconic sign may not be among those here at the Neon Museum, but that's because it is still standing high over the boulevard six decades after it was designed by artist Betty Willis. We're joined once again by Cynthia Bear Warso, Director of Curation and Education here at the Neon Museum. And Cynthia, the Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas sign was just one of many contributions by Betty Willis. That's correct, and we're so proud to have pieces in our collection from Betty. Uh, one of the most important are the letters from the 1955 Moulin Rouge, and uh, we also have a piece from the Del Mar Motel. And thank you for sharing her story as well. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Denise? As we continue to share stories of women who have helped make Las Vegas a place that we're proud to call home, this next woman's contributions are really immeasurable. Puna Mather is not just an executive, but also a champion for workplace diversity and a voice for those less fortunate. There's a spirit and a vibe and an energy in this community that no one, except for those of us that are, that are here, I think can even begin to appreciate the depth of the roots that give rise to our community. Her journey is anything but simple. The first couple of years were really difficult. Mather started delivering Valley newspapers, mowing lawns, and living off ramen and mac and cheese. Not only could I have not imagined how it all unfolded, I, I couldn't, it wasn't, 
even within my realm of conception. Fast forward a few decades and her feats could fill a few lifetimes. Mather operates her own business as a speaker, trainer and writer while serving as executive director of the Elaine P. Wynn and Family Foundation. Being able to do good work on behalf of a large organization where you can mobilize hundreds of volunteers and even more dollars to help community causes that's a wonderful way to make a living. She pushes for fundamental change through an avenue of civil rights, philanthropy, and conservation. A few years before, Mather led Envy Energy as a vice president and soared to the top of the ladder at MGM Resorts, all while raising a rock star family. So I've had a lot of great uh, mentors and people who have believed in me which is really the thing that creates opportunities. Mather hopes, above anything else, that her example will inspire other women to step up. I think our dreams are the fuel um, for our souls. And always chase the change. We've been doing it on every front and in heels. They want to see in the world. I get up every morning and just strive to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday. For Celebrating Women, I'm Sasha Loftus. Mather's not just a businesswoman and a champion for equal rights, she's also a mother of three children, all from foster care, whom she raised while she was working her way up the ladder. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. We want to thank each of the incredible women we interviewed for allowing us to tell their stories, and to the Neon Museum for giving us a place to tell them. For Celebrating Women, I'm Christiane Klein. And I'm Denise Valdez. Good night.